In this lecture, we're going to be looking at Luther in the formation of his church and his reformation in the second half of the 1520s. And we can begin by doing a quick recap of what we finished in our last lecture. Luther comes out of the Wartburg, having achieved an enormous success with the publication of the German New Testament. But he's met by controversy and problems related to just how far he was willing to take his Reformation. He struggles and contends against people like the Zwickau prophets and Thomas Munzer, as well as others, and he concludes with his attack on the German peasants who were uprising against their lords, and he finally comes openly to the conclusion that those who are part of his Reformation, at least for now, will condone no violence against the political order. We then concluded by looking at Luther the married man, as well as Luther's theological sparring match with Erasmus. And we pick up now in the mid-1520s, in 1525 in fact. And really this is a pivot point for Luther in terms of the development of his Reformation, due in large part to some swirling controversies and problems related to the German princes and to Charles V and the Holy Roman Empire. By this point in 1525, the Edict of Worms, the declaration by Charles that Luther is an outlaw, had grown a little cold, despite the fact that Charles had initially called for the arrest and the transfer of Luther to imperial hands so that he could be then put to death. There were a number of problems for Charles that caused him to simply look the other way and move on to other things first. And it's a bit of a challenge to understand this from afar, but perhaps the simplest way to say this is that Charles V was a staggeringly important person, not only in Reformation history, but simply in Western history itself. You see, because Charles, after his election to the Holy Roman Empire, as well as with the lands and the kingdoms that he had accrued through birth, was simply a staggeringly wealthy and powerful man controlling, frankly, just about half of Europe. He was the first king of Spain, areas like the Netherlands, obviously the Holy Roman Empire, parts of the Swiss regions, and others as well, were all within the orbit of Charles V. And Charles had been elected at the end of the 19-teens. So really, his coming to the throne coincides, in a way, with the rise of Luther's Reformation. But in terms of the political powers of Europe, not everyone was happy that the Habsburg dynasty, already powerful in their own right, had claimed the empire. And the most important and the initial person to really rebel against Charles and seek his demise was the king of France, Francis I. In fact, from 1521 to 1526, Francis I of France and Charles V of the Habsburg dynasty, the Holy Roman Emperor himself, engaged in what we now call the Italian Wars. And these were a series of wars in northern and central Italy to determine who was going to control the principal lands in these regions. These were lucrative lands, and they both wanted them. Also, since there was only a bit of land really in dispute in Europe, both of them were trying to gobble up the last bit of morsels of lands for themselves. So, by and large, Francis does everything he can to put Charles V off balance. In fact, it can be quite humorous at times. Francis will attack, be captured, or lose, only to go back, regroup, and do it again. So committed, in fact, was Francis to keep Charles off balance that at one point, Francis does something that is simply staggering by the rules of the day, which is he sends a representative to the court of Suleiman the Magnificent, the Muslim Ottoman leader, who at the time was expanding up the eastern flank of Charles's empire. So Francis takes the tactic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and he enacts a treaty with Suleiman to attack Charles V jointly. Now, this was a scandal to Christian emperors, that Francis would be so out for the demise of Charles V that he would partner with Muslim armies in an effort to defeat Charles. Well, the Italian wars come to a conclusion in 1525. February 24th, there was the Battle of Pavia. And in this battle, Francis is just simply annihilated. He loses a staggering number of troops, and he himself is captured. And he is forced to sign the Treaty of Madrid, which was all in Charles V's favor and had very little for Francis other than to stop attacking Charles. 
Well, it's at this point that if the wars had simply subsided, Charles would have turned his attention back to the Holy Roman Empire, and given that he was a committed Catholic, Charles would have gone after Luther almost certainly. But to the surprise of a number of people, Charles V not least, the Pope at the time, Clement VII, immediately does a pivot. You see, because from the very beginning of Charles's reign, the Pope, who was first Leo X and now Clement VII, were actually in partnership with Charles. They needed that partnership, in fact, in an effort to enforce the execution of Luther, as well as to secure the great power of the empire on behalf of the Pope. Well, for a number of reasons, Clement decides that Charles is now too powerful. And so Clement does a pivot. Immediately after this treaty, in which Francis gave up lands, and Charles now is the unrivaled authority in all of Europe, Clement does something that betrays Charles. Clement, using his power as Pope, releases Francis from the Treaty of Madrid, and he forms the League of Cognac, which was simply an anti-Habsburg or an anti-Charles League. England joins this league, France joins this league, Venice and others, and obviously the papacy as well. And so immediately after the end of the Italian Wars, here in 1526, for the next four years, all the way until 1530, Charles now has to contend himself against a united Europe with the papacy against him. And so yet again, Charles is unable to really care all that much about Luther, and instead has to secure his borders and his allies and defend himself against attacking armies. It's no wonder then that for the entirety of the 1520s, Luther really is left alone all the way out there in Wittenberg. Well, the issue comes to a head in 1527 between Charles and the papacy. You can only imagine Charles' opinion of this. He had supported the papacy. He had put Luther on trial. He'd done all kinds of things on behalf of the papacy. And now, just when he had secured his peace and had hoped for a cessation of wars, the Pope himself had enacted an entire league, a military league, that is now going to be coming after him. Well, in general, this entirely enrages not only Charles, though he is a relatively patient man, but also his armies and his lieutenants. And this comes to a head in 1527, shortly after the formation of the League of Cognac, when Charles's troops, at the time in the northern and central part of Italy, had been successful on their campaign and had done everything that was asked of them, only to then find out that Charles was out of money and unable to pay them. And so in the early half of the year, culminating in May 6th, the army mutinied, and marched on Rome. In fact, the sack of Rome, as it's now known, occurred. Charles V's armies sacked and looted and burned and attacked just about everything in sight in the city of Rome. In fact, Clement VII himself had to flee the Vatican as he was assaulted. And he can still actually see the place where he fled to. If you go to Rome today, there is a wonderful sort of island castle not too far from the Vatican itself. Well, in this day and age, there were a number of access points that all linked up between buildings, some of them going underground, and Clement, fleeing for his life, frankly, has to make his way quickly where, because it is an island and it has these very high walls, it is relatively impregnable from those who would attack. And you can only imagine what the armies would have done had they gotten their hands on Clement VII. Now, this is really a turn of events. Charles V from 1521, the man who put Luther on trial in the civil government and who had condemned him essentially to death, calling him an outlaw, his armies now mutinied, now attacking the papacy. And of course, Luther and his friends are howling about this back in Wittenberg. They just simply can't believe it. Six years on, here, the man who had condemned him as an outlaw is himself attacking the papacy violently. Luther actually says of this, marveling at the providence of Christ, says, how strange that the emperor who persecutes Luther for the Pope is forced to destroy the Pope for Luther. Now, what does all this have to do with Luther other than the fact that it keeps him alive? Well, actually quite a lot, and it actually has a dramatic effect on the shape not only of the Lutheran Reformation, but of the Swiss or Reformed Reformation, which we'll look at in greater detail when we get to Calvin. Because you see, Luther and academics and laymen were not the only ones who had converted to Luther's Reformation. 
there were actually now at this point two major princes, as well as a number of others, but two major princes in the German regions who had sided personally and in terms of their political might with Luther. The first is John of Saxony. Now, John is the successor of Frederick the Wise. And Frederick was a bit halting in his support for Luther. There's really no evidence that he himself became Protestant, though he might have. John, though, his successor, is a committed Protestant. And so now the area of Saxony, the very powerful area, is fully in support of Luther. The other German prince, who is very much in favor of the Reformation and very supportive of it, is Philip of Hesse. Now, Philip will have a long life, a long engagement with Protestantism over the last years of his life until his death. And by and large, Philip is very shrewd. And he's the one who actually leverages the political enterprises of the empire to both protect and advance the Reformation. And Philip actually takes the fact that Charles is preoccupied as an opportunity to get some things stalled or passed that could then further the Reformation. You see, because in the Edict of Worms in 1521, it was proclaimed that any who supported Luther or protected him or advanced his cause was themselves suspect and liable for prosecution. Well, in 1526, Charles called another diet, this time the city of Speyer. And in the summer of 1526, the Diet of Speyer meets. Now, Charles had intended to come himself, but due to the swirling events of the wars and the League of Cognac, etc., he was unable to attend, and he sent an ambassador on his behalf. Well, what's interesting about the Diet of Speyer is Charles wanted the Edict of Worms enforced. He wanted Luther brought out. He wanted the Reformation ended. He needed, Charles needed, Germany to be united with him. And the Reformation was gumming up the works of a united Germany now against the League of Cognac. Well, what's interesting about this diet is that it actually doesn't do anything to enforce the Edict of Worms. Rather, the assembly, unanimously we might add, called for a national gathering, a national convocation, to finally and once and for all decide what side of the Reformation Germany was going to be on. In other words, the first diet of spare does not come to a conclusion about the enforcement of Worms. Rather, they muddy up the waters and call for a convention to put to right all of the questions. And famously and importantly, they put a stop temporarily. Now, you must realize, temporarily, they put a stop to the Edict of Worms, saying that in the meantime, until this national convocation can occur, quote, every state shall so live, rule, and believe as it may hope. Now, what's intended by this is not a simple laissez-faire, believe what you want to believe kind of model. Rather, it's simply saying, we're not going to enforce anything until we have this convocation, so for right now, just simply let's calm down and wait until then. Well, Philip of Hesse and John of Saxony leverage this to the hilt. They go full bore, in fact. They read in this document that they have the ability not only to protect Luther, but to use this document, the Edict of Speyer, as an opportunity to advance the Reformation in full, because they're going to live however they choose. And so Philip, in particular, moves to sort of bring sympathetic Protestant rulers together in an effort to join an internal German league that might withstand the Catholic influence of Charles V. Now, by and large, this might very much have worked. There were enough people now who either for spiritual reasons had become Protestant or now, frankly, for political reasons, were so hacked off at Clement VII that they very much could have tolerated becoming Protestant just simply to spite him. And it very much might have worked if it were not for something that happened in 1528, just shortly thereafter. In 1528, there was a man by the name of Otto von Peck and Otto was a bit of a charlatan. In fact, he's gone down as one of the great bozos of history. He was a sort of high-ranking lieutenant, you might say, or a right-hand man for one of these sympathetic Protestant rulers. And in 1528, Otto von Pack creates a forgery in which he claims that the sympathetic Catholic rulers in Germany were ganging up and about to form a league against the Protestant armies. And he goes to John of Saxony first, who then convinces Philip of Hesse 
that these Catholics were about to join a league and come and attack them. Now again, this is an entire forgery. Otto is just simply fomenting a war. He dupes, in particular Philip, into believing that he has the smoking gun showing that the rulers of Mainz and other Catholic areas were now forming up a league against them. And Otto is pressing them to form a Protestant league and do a preemptive attack on the Catholics. I mean, ay ay ay. Otto is really playing with fire here. And it very nearly led to the full downfall of Philip and John because Philip is inclined to gather a Protestant league because he believes that this forgery is real. But shrewdly, wisely, Philip sends this off to Luther and Melanchthon and those in Wittenburg, who immediately say, no, this looks like a forgery. (laughs) And they question the document, and they tell them to hold off and not to form a league and to go to war. And then, not surprisingly, it comes out that the document is a forgery, and this is enormously embarrassing to the Protestant cause. In other words, there was sympathy within parts of Germany. Again, spiritually, some had committed to Protestantism. Politically, some were now opposed to the papacy because he had churned on the empire. Now, however, thanks to Otto, and thanks to Philip and John coming very nearly to believing them, now it's Protestantism that looks like the rebellious fomenters of treason and civil war within the empire. And a year later, in 1529, we have the second Diet of Spire, in which very little of the Protestant voice was allowed to have the ascendancy, and so the Diet of Spire doubles down on the Edict of Worms and again reinforces the condemnation of Luther and the Protestant Reformation in Germany. This really is one of those great what-if moments. What if Otto von Pack had not done this? What if Philip and John had not believed him at all from the very beginning? And we really don't know, but it is certainly intriguing to think. Had it not been for Otto von Pack, the tide could, could is the only word we can say because we won't know, but it could have swung fully in the Protestant direction, and Charles might very well, in the end, have been convinced to join the overwhelming support of the princes against the papacy for the Reformation. Well, again, we have to ask, what does this have to do with Luther? What does this have to do with the theology of the Reformation? Well, the short answer is, it forces Philip of Hesse to seek other allies now that he has thoroughly embarrassed himself and put on weaker ground the Protestant Reformation. And Philip reaches down into Switzerland in an effort to bring up a very influential group of people who he thinks might galvanize and strengthen the Protestant voice against Charles. And that is, Philip tries to enlist the help and the support and the partnership with Zurich and Zwingli. Now, Zwingli had been an early Protestant to join the Lutheran Reformation down in the German-Swiss regions. Zwingli, of course, is the originator of what we will call the Reformed tradition. He doesn't live long enough to really be given the title as the founder or the full developer of Reformed theology because he dies in 1531. But Zwingli was at least a potential strong ally. He was a strong voice on behalf of the Reformation, as were a number of his allies, people like Butzer, Ocalampadius, and others. Well, Zwingli and Luther were aware of each other. Because if you remember from our last lecture, Luther against the prophetic hordes that seemed to be scaling the battlements and coming after him and his Protestant Reformation, Luther had developed a real serious allergy to anyone who talked relatively excessively or extensively about the Spirit's action in the Christian life or in ministry itself. And we had talked about this word schwammer, fanatic, that Luther had sort of tarred and feathered anyone who disagreed with him with. Well, all the way back in 1526, Luther had become really concerned about a group that we today call the sacramentarians. That is, people who are unconvinced that in the Lord's Supper that we are physically eating Christ's body and blood. And this certainly was Zwingli. Zwingli did not believe in a physical eating of the Eucharist. Well, in 1526, Luther takes a strange tactic in which he writes a book called Against the Fanatics. And in this text, he goes after, in particular, anyone who believes that the eating of the Eucharist 
is anything but physical. And again, Luther is a bit raving in this book. But essentially, Luther's comments supporting physical eating of the Eucharist now basically mean that Zwingli and Zurich are, in his mind, heretics, despisers of God's word, and to be put down. Now, a year later, Zwingli actually writes a response to this. It actually has a funny title. It's called The Friendly Rejoinder to the Eminent Dr. Martin Luther Against the Fanatics. <laughs> Zwingli takes a sort of interesting tactic here. For the remainder of his life, he actually sort of pats Luther on the head and says, they're there. Not all of us are fanatics, big boy. You may get mad about things, but I'm really on your side. Zwingli actually says that Luther needs prayer in order for him to get over this sort of righteous indignation at anyone who doesn't believe everything he believes. Well, this is hardly good footing for a partnership, (laughs) at least politically, but certainly not theologically. However, because of the actions of Philip and John in their being duped by Otto von Pack, Hesse now applies a serious amount of pressure to try to bring Luther to the table with Zwingli in an effort to attempt to create a united Protestant front. And he does just this. From October 1st through the 4th, 1529, there met the Marburg Colloquy. And this really is sort of a spectacular moment in the early part of the Reformation. It's a who's who of everybody who's Protestant at this point. The people that were at this colloquy included not only Philip and eminent Protestant princes and voices from the political side, but also Luther, Zwingli, Bootser, Agricola, Justice Jonas, Melanchthon, Ocalampadius, and Osiander. In other words, virtually everyone from the Swiss and German Reformations. Now, the Marburg Colloquy was an attempt, again by Philip, to see if he can get them to come to enough of an agreement to create a political alliance. However, Luther and Zwingli were simply unable to do this. Luther famously either took chalk and wrote on the table during this debate, or had already written on the table and ripped the tablecloth off to point at it, quote, this is my body. For Luther, that text was ironclad. This is my body. It is a physical eating. Now, we're going to get later in this course to talk about Luther's doctrine of the sacraments and really go through the theology of it. But this is his beliefs worked out. This is my body, he said. And anyone who tries to apply logic or spins of phrases or strange hermeneutics in an effort to deny what Christ says here, this is my body, is a fanatic and a heretic. Now, Zwingli had a good response to this. He said, yes, he says, this is my body. But he also said that he was a vine. (laughs) He also said that he was a door. And I don't see you pounding the table saying that he is a door because the word is means is. Well, in the end, the Marburg Colloquy failed. All the Protestants agreed on 14 out of 15 points. And on the 15th point, the last point, they agreed on two out of the three points. Where Marburg failed, though, was on this point of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Was it physical, or was he spiritually there somehow by his spirit? And so the failure of the Reformed and the Lutherans to come together, despite Philip of Hesse's intentions, actually creates a permanent rift, frankly, between the Lutheran side and the new, what we now call, Reformed movement that is just getting off the ground with Zwingli. In fact, just a year later, 1530, at the Diet of Augsburg, a very famous diet, in which Charles V asked for a confession from the Lutherans to hear what they have to say on their theology, a move that actually gives the first great Lutheran confession to the world, the Augsburg Confession. In that confession, very clearly, is language about physical eating of Christ's body and blood. That for the foreseeable future, The only political partnership that could be had were those who agreed with Luther on the Eucharist. Excluded were the Swiss and the Reformed folks. And, as a result, when a Catholic army came to Zurich and attacked it in 1531, Zwingli out there attempting with his comrades and his friends and his colleagues in the city of Zurich, out defending the city, he is killed in battle, his body is desecrated, and it is then buried in an unmarked grave. 
And so died Zwingli, the early reformer in the Swiss regions, and the Lutheran Reformation went its own way. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to be looking at Luther and Agricola, one of Luther's earliest fights on the issue of antinomianism that occurred almost about the same time. Mm-hmm.